the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. On this third day of Christmas, as another year draws to a close, we come together before God and one another. Let us pray. God, full of grace, we confess we have been caught up in the frenzied spirit of the holidays and turned away from your spirit of peace. We confess that in our focus on making the season perfect, we have turned away from the hurting people and broken places in our world in need of healing. We confess that sometimes we have dismissed Christmas as a time only for children and we have stubbornly closed our hearts to your amazing love. O holy child of Bethlehem, Word made flesh, our Savior and King, hear us as we humbly pray. Sins and enter in, be born in us today. Hear the gospel of Christmas. Today God reveals to us the wonders of divine love. For unto us a child was born, and unto us a Savior is given. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Believe in the good news of the Gospel. Prepare our hearts for the hearing of God's word. Let us pray. Mighty God, the shepherds of old were full of your praises, saying that all they had heard and seen was mirrored by what they had been told. Move among us now with your Holy Spirit, that we too might hear and experience the wonder and joy of the living word as we seek to welcome the written word into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen now to a reading from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 5 and 11 through 14. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. 
The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the angel. Aha! <clears throat> Do you remember what the angel did in the Christmas story? What? Oh, I remember what you did in the Christmas story. You waved your horn and tooted, didn't you? You were an angel. I think this is supposed to be the angel of the Lord. Yes. yes. So he did some announcing. Who has the sheep? Aha, aha. Um, remember what the sheep did in the story? What did the sheep do in the story? What did the sheep say in the story? Bah. <laughs> I don't think the sheep caught on that there was a lot of really exciting stuff going on. Who has um, a shepherd? Aha. What did the shepherd do in the story? Really? Yeah. Okay. Who has Mary? Aha. Uh -huh. Pretty little girl. What did Mary do in the story? Anybody remember what Mary did in the story? A baby. All right, so where's the baby? Aha, put him right there. And his name was Jesus? And what did he do in the story? Leak. Leak. That's probably true. Maybe he cried a little bit. I don't know. Maybe he slept a little bit. But I have a question this morning. Who is the most, well, let, let's talk about something else first. Is an angel important? They're a messenger from God. I guess that makes them kind of important. Was Mary important? It'd been pretty hard to have Christmas without her, wouldn't it? Were the shepherds important? Medium? Medium. 
Um, was the sheep important? Yeah. Everybody was important, weren't they? Do you think the sheep was maybe as important as Mary? Careful with this answer. No, no, I agree. How about this baby? Can babies be important? No? Let me tell you something. This angel always was an angel. In fact, this angel is still an angel because angels never change. This shepherd went on to be a shepherd and he probably was a very good shepherd. And the sheep went on for a little while, sheep being what they are. Mary was a good mother and she saw many things in her life. But Jesus grew up to tell us almost everything we know about God. We knew some things before he came, but most of what we know, he taught us. And he died and was resurrected and saved us. That's kind of like the most important, don't you think? So, let's fold our hands, bow our heads, and all God's children pray. Dear God, you sent us Jesus. Help us remember he is more important than sheep. Angels, shepherds, Mary, or anyone else in the story. Thank you for sending us him. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate you coming forward. Colossians 3, starting with the 12th verse. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in your midst. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Now, I kind of suspect some of you are going, that is the shortest sermon I ever heard. Because we usually don't sing the hymn until after the sermon. And we're doing it differently this morning. And you might ask, how can we do such a thing? It's amazing the walls of the church are still standing, but they are. But there was a reason I wanted us to sing that first. I was hoping you would notice something. Did you notice the second verse where they seem to have changed some of the words? We are so used to singing, this, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. And what did our hymnal have? Nails, spears shall pierce him through, the cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the world made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. Now, where did that come from? To find the answer to that and to talk about the whys, we need to go back, actually, exactly 150 years. The year is 1865. In the United States, the Civil War has just drawn to a close, and they are still reeling from all the implications and all the struggles that have happened. But across the Atlantic, in Great Britain, things are a little calmer. In Glasgow, Scotland, 150 years ago, a young man, just 29 years old, lies in a bed trying to recover from a sudden and unexpected illness that almost took his life. He's so weak he can hardly walk across his bedroom, and he's been this way for weeks that have turning into months. William Chatterton Dix, had come to Scotland to take a position as a manager of an insurance company that dealt with maritime customers. He had been born and raised in Bristol, England. He was the son of a local surgeon. He had received a middle-in education that prepared him for work in the mercantile trade. The offer of the job in Scotland had been his big break. He moved there totally on his own, leaving behind family, friends, and a fiancé. When he made his way, the plan was, he would send for her and then they would be married. Things looked bright, but they didn't turn out that way. As I said, William became very ill with a malady that left him bedridden for several months. During that time, his salary was stopped. And then he received a letter from his fiancée who told him she was ready to become his ex-fiancée. He didn't have the strength or the resources to go home to England, and he lay in his bed subsisting on a meager diet with the bills piling up and knowing very few people in town who would even come to visit him. Not surprisingly, he became very depressed. Now, there are many ways this story could end. But how it turned out for William was this. He turned to God. During these bleak months, William had a profound spiritual awakening. A rather surprising event for those who had known him as a young boy because William came from a family that wasn't profoundly musical or profoundly religious. But now he spent hours reading scriptures and writing poems that reflected his newly found faith. Finally, he did recover enough to return to his job in insurance. And he made up for lost time, and that took his concentration for a while. But a couple of years later, he came back to those poems he had read. And on a whim, he sent a couple into a local magazine to see if they would publish them. They did publish them. And people liked them. And he became almost inadvertently known as a pretty good poet. Do you have any more of those? A couple of years later, he was persuaded to take one of the poems that he wrote during those, that dark time, which was called The Manger Throne, and break it up, because it was a long poem, and see if he could set certain segments to music so they could be sung. And now he not only was known as a poet, but he was beginning to be known as a hymn writer. <laughs> One section of those expanded into lyrics words were put to music. He chose 
a folk song called Green Sleeves, which was an Elizabethan tune that had recently begun to fall into disfavor because the words to the tune were about a somewhat disreputable lady who in the English vernacular was no better than she ought to be. So we have this beautiful tune with a somewhat shady past and a beautiful poem born out of a very harsh reality and they were blended together into this lovely Christmas carol. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels sing with anthems sweet while shepherds watch her keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds watch and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. William Chatterton Dix would go on to write more hymns, at least 40 of them. You can look it up sometime. Our hymnal contains three, but not during the sermon, later. <laughs> Over his lifetime, he published four volumes of hymns, two devotional works, and a book of instruction for children. He also began to translate hymns that had been written in Greek and in Armenian into English. And he translated quite a few hymns that were used. He continued to write poems that were published in regional and national magazines. And all during this literary outpouring, he went every day and was the manager of an insurance company that dealt with maritime customers. He moved back to England only when he retired. Having once been jilted, he never did get married. Now you know about the writer of our hymn. So I will now answer the question. And you're going, what was the question? <laughs> well, it was this. Why does the second verse of what child is this in our hymnal have different words than the ones we are used to singing? And the answer is a very simple one. These words that today sound foreign to us are the words that William Chatterton Dix originally wrote. He wrote about the nails and the cross and the word made flesh because he felt that was a vital part of the story. That is the part of the hymn that answered the question he raised at the beginning of the hymn. What child is this? This child is Christ the Lord. And the cross and the incarnation that is alluded to in verse 2 is the explanation of what it means to be Christ the Lord. And I find myself thinking that the question we should be asking isn't so much why did our new hymnal bring these words back? The question we should be asking is why were these words taken out in the first place? Why did they repeat the last couple of words in the first verse as a refrain in the second and take these out? Now I have quite a stack of hymnals in my library. Anytime someone dies or is changing homes and they have a hymnal they don't know what to do with, you know what they do with it? They give it to your pastor who then ends up with quite a nice stack of hymnals from all over the place. And so I paged through them, looking especially at what child is this, and I noticed that the cross and the nail words began to change in the early 50s, and for the most part, were completely gone by the 60s. So this is not some recent liberal onslaught on Christmas done by people who are waging war on Christmas or any of that silliness. This was done when the churches were at their heyday, packed with members. To put it on a local scale, this was done when this building was new and full of life. It was done in what many in this room would like to think of as the good old days. Christmas has been taking on a separate meeting from the Christian message for a long time. You can love him or you cannot love him, but Santa Claus has taken center stage for the Christmas festivities. We are up to our armpits in reindeer, snowmen, Grinches who steal Christmas, and elves who sit on shelves. And every once in a while, a clergy brother or sister 
gets all fed up with this and goes on a rampage about it and rails about how we're losing the meaning of Christmas. But there's a more deadly challenge to our faith that's going on. And it's not between the secular world and the world of faith. It's in the world of faith itself. Let me give you an example. Do you remember a couple of years ago there was a lot of Christmas merchandise that worked on the word believe? There were signs that said believe and Christmas cards that said believe. So one time I picked up one of those and I went to a gathering of church people that we were with and I informally posed the question, believe, believe in what? What do you think they are trying to get you to believe in? What are they trying to remind you of? And I got answers like, we're supposed to believe in the magic of the season. We're supposed to believe in Santa Claus. We're supposed to believe in the joy of family or the innocence of children or the power of love or how angels whisper in our ears. Now, I will tell you this is absolutely not a scientific poll. But of the about 17 people I talked to, only one came up with an answer that sounded anywhere near William Dix's. One lady said, I think it means we should believe in Christ who came to save us. Now, don't get me wrong. Any of those people I have talked to, if I had pressured them, would have remembered the gospel message they could have told me clearly what it was. These were Christian people. But somehow the message of Christmas had been buried, diluted somehow in the barrage of other stuff that has come to make up the meaning of Christmas in their minds. Last week leaving the Christmas pageant, a well-wisher had left me with that well-known sediment Oh, well, Christmas is for children. They beamed and they walked out. Knowing that I did not have time to explain myself, I did not yell after them. See, I have some self-control. I did not yell after them. Yes, Christmas is for children. And for teenagers and young adults and middle-aged people and early retirement people and grouchy old codgers and any other age group you wish to mention. Because this season is not a celebration of childhood, it's the beginning of the gospel of Christ. It's the best news ever shared with humankind, ever. And I did not yell that down the hall after them, but I was sorely tempted. It wasn't secular interest that removed Dix's answer to the question, what child is this? It was the publishers of hymnals and the groups of people of faith who reviewed this process and who somewhere said some version of, yes, let's leave out the nails and the cross thing. After all, this is Christmas. Instead of saying, and that's the best reason to leave them in. It is possible that one of the biggest distortions of the Christmas season is not replacing the nativity with Santa and the elves. It might be wanting to focus only on the babe in the manger and missing the risen Christ. If at Christmas we tiptoe up to the stable and go, aw, over that cute little baby, and that's all we do, we have no story at all. If we don't disciple ourselves to the teacher who was Jesus, if we don't rely on God's grace which is displayed in Christ's resurrection, if we don't try to mold our lives based on the teaching of the word of God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then Christmas is a hollow celebration. I was thinking of these things when I opened the lectionary to see the scriptures that were suggested reading for first Sunday of Christmas season, December 27th. And one of them was that reading from the third chapter of Colossians that we read earlier. And at first that struck me odd. Of all the stories we could tell about Simeon or 
Anna, of all the stories we could tell about uh, Jesus' early days or Mary treasuring things in her heart. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about today. Why do we have third Colossians? And then all of a sudden it all fell into place and made perfect sense. You know, there are several places in the New Testament, like this one, that have lists. They were a way for the new believer in Christ to gauge their lives in the lights of the many gifts that God, Christ the Spirit, had offered them. And to say, and, and how is this working in your life? Look at the list. How, how are you? How is it? So let us, in the light of Christmas, you know, the wonderful Christmas we just experienced? Let us look at this passage and apply it to where we are. Colossians 3. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you should also forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into the body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach. Admonish one another in all wisdom. With gratitudes in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Is that real to you? Does it become more real to you as you live out your life? Have you learned, grown, and stretched? Can you use this ruler of faith to measure where you are and where you have been? If so, congratulations. You have experienced what it is we celebrate at Christmas. And if not, don't despair. There's still time. Start now. In thanksgiving to the gifts that God has given us, let us give back.
of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude that through us all people may know the riches of your love in the word made flesh. Amen. I would like you to know that I'm not against changing certain words in hymns sometimes. I remember um, preaching in North Carolina in the hills, and a lot of the people who lived there lived on land that had been given to their families by the king before the revolution. They were settled in their ways. And they also had very thick hill accents. And a little girl came up to me after we had sang, what child is this? Haste, haste to bring him laud, babe the sign, son of Mary. Her mother was the baker of some of the best pies on Green Hill Road. And she says, I just don't get it. Why do we want to bring him laud? Is he going to make pies? <laughs> and I thought perhaps praise might work better in certain circumstances. <laughs> Let's enjoy the blessings of being able to pray together as the child children of God. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks this day for the gift of life for the joy of Christ's birth and the hope of the new year that's before us. And as our thoughts today are drawn to the conclusion of one year and the beginning of the next, help us to remember that we're still immersed in the miracle of Christmas. With the roar of Christmas celebrations behind us, surprise us new with the mystery of the Incarnation the reality of Christ with us, inspire our faith to proclaim with boldness the good news. Fill us with your spirit that we enter this new year renewed and transformed and willing to join together in the renewing and transformation of our world. Lord, we worry about our world. We continue to pray for peace efforts, for refugees in crowded camps, for victims of violence in every corner of the world, for governments that oppress those within their borders. All of it reminds us how desperately your perfect love is needed. We pray for family and friends trying to meet the challenges of daily life, worried about children, fighting illnesses, overwhelmed by depression, struggling with relationships, grieving the death of a loved one. Break into those lives with at least a glimmer of light and show us how we can help. We pray this morning for families whose homes have been destroyed or who have lost family members in the recent flurry of storms. It's always hard to go through times like that. It seems especially hard at Christmas. But God, we pray that we use all the challenges in our lives, our worries, our fears, the roadblocks that are in our way, to draw us even more closely to you. Because in the deepest places of our souls, somehow we know you are here. Let us, the brothers and sisters of this child of peace, fill the glory of the nativity. We pray in the name of Emmanuel, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And may the blessings of Christmas and the joys given to us by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us this week and throughout the new year.